ouvimos There have actually been two investigations, one in 2018 that found deplorable conditions and a follow-up last November that determined nothing had changed. The conditions are inhumane, absolutely unjust, and honestly unconscionable. Elizabeth Hill. Look at this glider woman bitching about this, the, the conditions at the county jail, at the youth detention center in Baltimore county <laughs> the acting director of government relations for the office of public defender is talking about the living conditions of kids jailed at the baltimore county detention center an investigation by a division of the public defender's office finds children are locked up for as many as 23 hours a day in rat infested cells that regularly flood with contaminated toilet water and debris and almost all but you know they intentionally flood the cells right who knows that hit one if you know that that's like a way to um that's like a protest when they they they, they intentionally that's flood play time to get out of the cell yeah yeah that, that's 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 um that's something they do intentionally everybody and, act like they're mad but it's a, for real it's a party exactly and and now for the record the rat infested i mean yeah that's that's a problem because rat feces um has a lot of diseases in it and um even rat urine so yeah that that's a problem but um the the flooding of this they do that um and um what else did she say was wrong with it this fines children are locked up for as many as 23 hours a day yeah um why you think they would lock a kid up for 23 hours a day just uh because he's black I mean, come on, behavioral issues, man. And rat infested cells that regularly flood with contaminated toilet water and debris. And almost all of these children are being held in what amounts to solitary confinement because they, they don't have the resources. This facility doesn't have the ability to do anything other than hold them. Because there's so many sun teens getting arrested that is overloaded the criminal justice system. When these gliders start up these, the, the, this criminal justice system, this complex, when they th when they, when a, a room full of gliders, I guarantee you there wasn't a sun person in the room. Glider men. This. Yeah, when they designed this facility. They didn't design it for just a fucking, fucking damn break schools oh. with fights of 200 people yeah just sons just coming in and coming in and now you got so many sons that you just gotta have some all right you guys the worst ones you just stay in your cell all day um like you know what I'm saying? like we can't even fucking deal like and then the staff like this place is probably understaffed hey come on man but the public defender's office finds children are locked up for as many as 23 hours a day and rat infested cells that regularly flood with contaminated toilet water and debris. And almost all of these children are being held in what amounts to solitary confinement because they, they don't have the resources, this facility doesn't have the ability to do anything other than hold them for 23 hours. One of the children hasn't been outside in two years. The Juvenile Protection Division probe also discovered juveniles sleep on floor mats. They have limited access to showers wash their clothes in the cell sink. There's no schooling provided, no adult separation, no recreation, nor mental health services. Well, the limited access to showers could probably be because when you let them out, there's probably a lot of violence. The sleeping on the floor mats is probably overcrowding. Washing your clothes in the cell sink, I mean, Listen, man, like this it's all normal jail to me. Yeah, it's just jail. Not even in a white jail in the country. Me, me, meanwhile, in Africa, they've got 7,000 inmates in a prison of 400 people. Well, that's the thing, too. Like, can you imagine, like, you've done, Ak, you've done pieces on jail conditions in Africa. 
Can you imagine to the extent that there's mass media in Africa, to the extent that there's people who sit down in the urban centers, at least sit down and watch television. And there's something like a news program. Can you imagine a feature on Nigerian television, Senegalese television, bitching and whining about the conditions that the prisoners are subjected to and they don't get to wash their feet and they don't get to clip their toenails and they don't get to comb mm-hmm. their hair. Can you imagine that even being made a subject of, of complaint, of critique no. on television in that situation? Nigerians would not, they, they would, Nigerians would be like, good for them. That is good. It is jet. It is supposed to be like, that. like they, they have a different mindset about it. Like they like, like, they're not American, so they have a yeah. good riddance type of mindset. Glid- gliders treat jail like it's supposed to be rehab, like Club Med or some bullshit. Yeah, the rehab is rehabilitation is a glider. Um, yeah, it works in glider countries in Europe. Yeah. It doesn't work on some teams. Yeah, you can't rehabilitate. Um, you get rehabilitate. It, I, now, listen, I'm not going to say can't, but rehabilitation is very, very difficult. Um, with us because we're different. You would have done whatever you have. You would have put a gun in an old lady's face. Well, if we had guns, you would put a spear in an old woman's face and stolen her goat. And the town people would have caught up with you, and you would have been dead within hours, if not minutes. So you you evolve to not even be alive at the time. We, we these people wouldn't even be alive anymore during the evolution of sun people in in, in, in in sun places. So these people would already be dead. So it's like the whole thing of like feeding you one more meal after you've pushed the old lady down the steps and taken her purse. Feeding you one yeah, more anything meal. But, yeah. <laughs> and the, the death march, the death march to take you to the place you commit the crime. The, the 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 townspeople come to deal with you and transporting you in the time it takes to transport you from where you did it to where you're going to meet your end. If the, no behavior toward the criminal on the part of the townspeople can be anything but vicious in that context, it would make no sense for anybody even to make, you know, casual, friendly chit chat with the person on the way, knowing, well, you're going to die anyway. No, they wouldn't do it. The whole attitude is about everybody in the town is set from two-year-olds to 80-year-olds is celebrating and and agreeing with the fact that this person is about to get sliced and diced and is going to scream and holler and is going to get hogtied and whipped and everything the and look at the oppositeness of the attitude just about how people talk in glider communities about especially sun people in incarceration it's all about are they taken care of are they okay were we sufficiently friendly to them did we violate their rights it doesn't they could have a rap sheet full of the most brutal heinous acts and nobody is going to say a peep about it you won't even know it if you watch the news programs every single thing that's said about it is are we being nice enough to these guys? Are we giving them a raw deal? You know, it's like the shit runs deep. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's multicultural societies. It's having on those children, right? But when you continue to subject someone to conditions like this, I mean, it's just really atrocious. The public defender's office is calling for the immediate transfer of detained youth. They outline concerns in a letter to Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski's office. His press office provided us with a response writing, our administration is carefully reviewing the letter and the concerning allegations it raised. We will closely evaluate current policies and provide a thorough response. You need care and not cages. The OPD and youth advocates have rallied in Lawyers Mall in support of legislation they say would resolve the problem. The bill ends the practice of automatically charging kids. Let's see this. Let's see this group of Motley crew right here. (laughs) <laughs> what is she doing down here you're like the number like if if i'm cruising the mall for someone to carjack and these are all the people that are getting out of their cars you're that's the women fishermen talk about <laughs> you're the what you her. you no her her here her here no she's the first one i'm going for but after that her <laughs> 
<laughs> so to what when you say that when you say that to what extent is it in your mind somewhere in the recesses of your mind whether it's conscious or not that the reason why part of the reason why those women are that kind of easy target is because you understand you know you're getting the same messaging they're getting and you see them responding to that you see how they respond to it they affirm it and what that messaging is is that your skin is a force field well, you know look at saying? that white boy beside him. Uh, look I at the think, white boy. Yeah, he looks yeah. like he'd be a skateboard or something. What's he doing there? But but here's the thing: the reason I'm. But so, in other words, as a sun person, you already you already understand how those women are going to respond to your advances, to your overtures. You know that you've got an in because of the way that they're participating in society. Like you understand that. Well, no. Here's here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. It, 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 I think is I think maybe that might be on a subconscious level. But on the conscious level, it's that, yo, she ain't packing. Like, even in a democratic city, we don't think any white person is packing. But you just know she's not packing. If she pulled out a gun and shot you and produced a gun and pointed at you, you'd have a heart attack and you'd die of a heart attack before she shot you. So this this woman doesn't, she's not packing. She doesn't have a knife. She doesn't have bone density she doesn't have muscle mass and she's not a from a place where violence is is something that she could react to in any way so she's gonna be the easiest i'm not saying that i couldn't take this woman's car either i'm not saying that i couldn't take her purse either i'm just saying that in my mind if i'm looking at this crowd this woman's got a cut, a son or a nephew that's a fucking hoodlum or thug, and she kind of like knows a little bit about it. I'm looking at this person, they have no fucking clue about any about the dredges and the depths of the shit. Plus the uh, truth oh, sorry. plus truth be told, the, the older black lady, she's gonna size you up just just like she would me, because I, you know, I look like a redneck. I look like, you know, a rough looking white dude. She's gonna do the same thing to you, whereas the mm -hmm. white lady is gonna, you know, she's gonna be more welcoming. Yeah, but she's care. not allowed to size you up. No, exactly. I know that, yeah, That's uh, what I'm saying. The older you, black lady can because she doesn't live with the parameters exactly. of racism. Right. Exactly. So yeah. The this this white lady is riddled and she it, it oozes out of her pores and her mannerisms. Look how meekly they're sta she's standing. She fits not only all of those kinds of things that are obvious in terms of she's she's weak, she's unsuspecting, she's probably not packing a gun, but she fits the profile of the kind of person that's going to show up to something like this and advocate for the kind of person that's going to victimize her like that. She, she's begging for social validation. Yeah. She wants she wants to feel accepted and she wants to feel like she's doing the right thing. And, and everybody's and she doesn't, getting yes. She doesn't understand that she's only going to take herself further down a rabbit hole of self-destruction. No, she's she's stuck. And this this power structure is not built for her to survive or to do well or to be able to right. act reasonably on. on she's going to she's going she's gonna to do exactly what she was programmed to do, which is create a victim, which will be her. Right. Before. And I'm saying that the signaling that the signaling that that programs that into her mind everybody's getting the same signals everybody knows that she knows that in order to be that good person that she desperately wants to be she needs to when she sees that melanin she needs to stand down otherwise it's 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 not just the person that she's struggling against it's the the parameters like you said you know that she is uh be, is bound to um adhere to and i think that she, whether it's 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 not entirely conscious it's not something that people think about when they victimize people but you read it in her mannerisms and everybody's getting the same messaging in society mm. kids have rallied in lawyers mall in support of legislation they say oh, would resolve the problem the bill ends the practice of automatically charging kids accused of serious crimes as adults but that legislation remains stuck in committee you don't put a butterfly band-aid on a gaping wound right the change needs to start with the law. It needs to start here in Annapolis, and it needs to start now. Youth advocates have been trying to change the law for more than a decade, but that bill and similar legislation in the Senate both remain stuck in committee.
Reporting from Annapolis, David Collins, WBAL TV 11 News. Wow, what a strange fucking city, man. Um, And that's right. You know, police are still looking for the shooter tonight. And Carter's mother is asking anyone with any information to come forward. She said her son was a caring person and that it still doesn't feel like he's gone. And it was like, I'm just still waiting for, I'm still waiting to see him. Like, it doesn't feel real at all. Like, not even a little bit. Michelle Hines is the mother of 16-year-old Isaiah Carter. On Monday, police say that someone shot and killed Carter in the Joseph Lee Playfields area near Patterson High School where he was a student. He was just so giving and he was so caring. He was so listening. Every step of the way, he was trying to make improvement. Hines tells 11 News that there was an altercation with Carter and some other kids a few months ago, so she was already concerned about his safety. I begged the school. I begged staff. I said I wanted to know that my son is going to be safe. Joyce Johnson says she cared for Carter as her grandson. He was humble. He was nice and humble. You know, he would do anything he could for you. He would come down my house. Mr. Joyce, you want me to do anything for you? And he was generally, he was one of genuine good kids. She thinks we all need to do more to prevent teens from being murdered. If you can't send your children to school without something happening to them, without them coming home, I don't, I really, truly don't know. And it's not just one person. I can't blame it on the mayor. I can't blame the commissioner because it's not just one person. Everybody have to come together. Carter and his father worked at Forno Restaurant and Wine Bar in downtown Baltimore. Thursday night, the restaurant hosted an extended happy hour and 20% from anything bought will go to Carter's family. It's just really sad, the situation. I mean, these are babies killing each other and it keeps happening and it needs to be brought to light. Isaiah's name is going to be one that is not forgotten because I'm not going to let it be forgotten. Those son sisters seem to be taking this well, though. Like, I mean, what do you think about that, Fabian? The fact that, like, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's, there's some, there was some, you know, consternation there, but they seem to take it very well. Just, yeah, they're good with it. They they take this like it, it, it's not like what you would think. Like that boy's dead, dead, dead. You you would think that it would be you know a bigger deal, but um, it could be. It could be the fact that like it happened so much, man. Um. Um. I, yeah, I, I think it's. To... I think it's. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I try and give them the benefit because of the shock value when you see these interviews that people are in shock. Right. But right. sometimes, like the gatherings at the funerals, it's almost like, yeah, it's a celebration of life, but it's just like all the women, the support system, it's like they're all good for it. And it's just like, okay, it's her turn now. Let's go, you know, let's go help her out and support her because next month it'll be my turn instead of just standing up to stop, you know young black men from being killed because nobody wants to stop it. Everybody likes it, apparently. Nobody will say the damn truth. But uh, yeah, I think it's channel. right. I think it's a, I think it's both at the same time. It's one of those things where it's hard to place the, the chicken and the egg uh, between, you know, the nurture aspect and the nature aspect. The fact that people respond seemingly casually to high volumes of death and also the fact that I think you could reasonably say that the psychology and the, the kind of instinctive expectations in terms of and the, and the understanding, the feeling about life and death, the difference between life and death and the significance of a person and a person's life, you know, how those things kind of evolve in, in populations um, I think that you do kind of you can you can kind of see patterns with that. If you look at like how, how massively people reproduce and how sort of reproductive behavior in Africa has tended to be for the entirety of you know the, well, the evolution of, of this. If you notice, form. if you notice, she had a different last name than her son, right? And that's yeah, the sure. And then, yeah. With all these stories, right. the mother never has the same last name as the son. 
Right. It's typical. So, yeah, you can say like, well, these are environmental factors, but they derive from, I think, uh, hardwired tendencies. Yeah, it's it just it's just it's the, 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 the father, the mother father relationship is for breeding, not for raising, not for rearing. Yeah. In, in some in some communities. Um, let's see this one. At least nine of the 10 students once walked the hallways here. Now they want to see other students take a similar path to success. From the classroom to the real world, this group has all remained focused on career and wealth building. They're members of a newly formed organization called the SYP Foundation Incorporated. SYP Foundation, it stands for Stack Your Paper. Um, we believe in using money as a tool um, just to give back to the community and be a resource to gain financial freedom. And that's exactly what's taking place. These men are using their resources to help a total of six students, three in public high schools in Baltimore County and Baltimore City, and three for current HBCU students to graduate and to become successful by providing them with $1,700 and $300 scholarship awards. Surprisingly, we got together over the summer of 2020 and we said we were going to do a scholarship. That meeting turned from 45 minutes to three hours and we came out saying we were going to be a foundation. The group formed a relationship back in high school and they've stayed in touch ever since. You know, at Western Tech, we were focused on going to college, starting careers, but we didn't want to reach our heights in our careers to give back. We wanted to start it right away. It's just kind of a reflection of ourselves, like looking back and how when I was in high school, applying for scholarships, applying to college, trying to get to the next steps. I'm just trying to help somebody else, paying it for, giving my hand to the next hand. The SYP scholarship does not focus on a grade point average or a college essay. Instead, applicants must submit a two to three minute video explaining what financial empowerment means to them. It feels so good. And you know what? I, I think that's good because it is easier. Some people are, we're better at oration and charis things dealing with charisma. That is something that we're better at than a test or an essay. You, you get a question and you got to write about an essay. We're better at that. And I think that this is them subconsciously, you know, gearing the, um, because all these guys went to college and, 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 and seem to have done very well for themselves, gearing the, um, the requirements to what they subconsciously know are some student strips, right, Fabian? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think there should be, all kinds of room for some people to be able to explore, to be honest with themselves, not, not, not about um, capacity, higher or lower, but just different strengths and to explore those and build institutions for themselves on the basis of those strengths, you know, and, and push the, push the limits of that, push the parameters and push their capacities for sure. Yeah. But Even the name stack that we all came together judgy. to pull our resources. Did what? Even that name, stack your paper, you know, that's catchy to get, you know, young black men to get, of you course. know, they find out it's a way, you know. The, and, and and I promise you that they didn't even probably do that consciously. This is just the, yeah, they, being you got real. them all in a room. You got all these guys in a the room. They said they got in a room together and before, and, and their, their mind, their collective minds came up with this. There's no white people in the room. So it doesn't even have to be catchy about stack your paper. It just this is just their collective mind. And they said, you know what? If we go on GPA and essays, we're not gonna get the we're gonna miss out on some kids. We're gonna miss out on a lot of kids that might, you know, need that because obviously we just did a story the other day. What zero, what set, what is it, 23 schools with no kids were proficient in reading or math why would you then if you're some brothers trying to help and reach back into the community require people to have high gpas and be able to fucking answer essay questions in a way that's competing with other essays you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah and unless unless somebody unless somebody comes around and gasses them up that it's a problem they're not going to worry 
I, I don't think they're going to be that worried about the fact that they're not then going into professions that require those skills because they're they're not inclined to they're not inclined toward them. Yeah, exactly, man. So this is I think this I think this is actually great. This is great that these brothers are doing, man. He says that when we give those scholarships back to those students, how are they responding? You know, how are their families reacting when they actually have a tangible item to say, you know, someone is helping us pay for go to school. So it's just a blessing. The long term goal is to expand the scholarship to see more students go to college. And for that to happen, they're looking for more supporters. On the campus of Western School of Technology, Tim Tootin, WBAL. The main problem I have is like being a good order. What does that get you going through college? I mean, what job are you going to get? Well, you could be a you could be a news anchor. You could be a sports anchor. You could be um, a, a singer. You could be a um, you could yeah, be but, a, an but you're looking at you're looking at jobs that one out of every ten thousand people get. Well, like, hold you're not on. talking about hold like on. an accountant time, or time, an time, engineer time, time. where there's a lot of let different stop positions. Let me stop you. Let me stop you. We go around the country to Little Rock, Boise, Des Moines, a billion cities every day, and they all have their fucking anchors and their reporter in the field. They all have this and that, da 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 da. And they're mostly always black, right? So there are plenty of jobs in that shit. Yeah, but how, but how many how many anchors do you think there are? Like maybe <laughs> Maybe two thousand, three thousand guys that are actually show up on TV. Okay, but here's here's my thing. That's just one avenue. There's other ways where your oration and your ability to you know um, improvise and 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 present and, and um, bend language or what? I don't know what you yeah. call it. But like like, a lot of know. them guys behind the scenes that support those anchors, they're they they all need to to be able to write stuff and research stuff. Well, I mean, these guys can present. You would have these guys would be able to um, create a um, a two minute piece that you see it all the time, like in every in every. All right, let's let's, let's I I get what you're saying, but I mean, I I think that there's plenty of avenues where your oration, your ability to, you know, be a supreme orator or to be a somebody who can you know use their charisma um, and, and things like that. Um, there's plenty of jobs that you know for for that. Well, today, police officers in the Hermanos Mios Youth Program were at Patterson High School to meet with students. Meantime, city leaders just a few miles away were meeting to discuss how to address the spike in youth violence. First, it's a fight. Then, before you know it, there's picking up a gun, and before you know it, unfortunately, she's using that gun. Baltimore leaders came together Wednesday to discuss the city's progress, bringing down crime, calling attention to youth violence. Recently, there's been a spike in young, uh, young people, uh, particularly around our uh, public schools. See, here's the thing that annoys me about this spike. It's the same thing that annoys me about um, the year. Like, like for instance, Baltimore, yeah, 350 murders in 2022. Let's just say that, right? This year, if they have 339, they'll brag about it without thinking that seven, damn near 700 people have been killed the last 24 months. That's not a victory that in the second 12-month period of that 24 months, 11 less were killed. Yeah, <laughs> How often ought to these same people pretend that the youth, that this is something new that, I mean, it's, I'm yeah, almost I'm 49 saying. next week. It's always been 16, 17, 18 year olds that do the killing. It's always been that way. Exactly. And, 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 and this whole spike in youth crime, there's no spike in youth crime. It's all, it's out of fuck. This same new story is done every two months. Every month, every week, every time we come to Baltimore, it's the same story. There's a spike in you. What are you talking about? A spike, a spike on top of the last spike? It just is what it is. Council members asking. Go ahead, man. 
but what they're going to end up doing is they they talk all this good talk so they can get more money. But remember, you, you guys did a video like last week. Man. You guys did a video last week where you found out how much they were spending on these schools. Somebody's embezzling the fucking money. Like you yeah. have twenty four thousand dollars per kid. Do the math. Well, yeah. You know, I you've mean, got thirty kids in a room, twenty five kids in a room. That's like six hundred thousand dollars a classroom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we know that people are stealing the money. That that goes without saying. Yeah. Police Commissioner Michael Harrison about how his force is working with city schools. We're in constant conversations and collaboration with the school police on an everyday basis about deployment strategies, visibility, who's not in school. Deployment strategies and visibility. So the fact that these students need to see police, that's a big part of it. If they they have to make sure that the kids are constantly seeing police. And it's just amazing that we have this and the other narrative working at the same time. (laughs) They literally say this, like, like, Think about it. He's not, he just, what he just said, somebody got the, the shit playing in the background, but what he just said is he literally just said, visible. like, if a white person said that, man, we need to make sure that these young black teens see police everywhere they go during the school day, they're, while they're going to it for school, just to keep them in line. That person would fucking never work again. Oh, yeah. That, that would be an act of uh, stochastic terrorism, man. It's just insane. Man. But it's they're crazy. not even going to go. Like, like, could you imagine being a white cop trying to stop any kid in these schools? Yeah, man. I would just freaking call them and be like, I got a 1619. You know, somebody freaking send Shaniqua in here. I ain't going in. It yeah. ain't no better for oh, the yeah, black cops. They catch L2. Yep about how his force is working with city schools. We're in constant conversations and collaboration with the school police on an everyday basis about deployment strategies, visibility, who's not in school, what what do we collectively need to do, where we need to be and when we need to be there. This after 16-year-old Isaiah Carter was shot and killed at a park near Patterson High School. This is a tragedy, right? This is a tra- tragedy that happened to this kid. You know, a good kid. Miguel Rodriguez is a chair member for the Hispanic Organization of Leadership Advancement, or OLA, and a Baltimore City police detective. The program's mentorship division met with students at Patterson High School Wednesday to listen and offer emotional support. Rodriguez says it'll take more community members stepping up to help at-risk youth to end the violence. A lot of folks today, they need to get involved with their local schools and their community. They need to do it. You don't need to have a son. You don't need to have a daughter that are involved there. You need to get involved because that school is part of your community. And do we what the investigation. Exactly? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you don't have a kid, like, if you're a single man, shows up to a school that has no kid, like, I really want to help these kids and be around them. Like, how fucking weird is that? What are you supposed to do? Just imagine if, like, this this phrase, like, at-risk youth, just imagine what it would be like, how different the world would be just by changing the phrase at-risk youth to heartless, violent killers. Because mm-hmm. that's what you're talking about. That ROTC uniform that, that the young man that died wearing, that could, that could start, could lead to his death. Could be clowning like, "Oh, you're a square. You with the white people." My my daughter went to school like that and and did that, and was accused. Mm. You know, like people, and that that right there can lead for a young black man. That can lead to an argument or other yeah. son teens picking on him and escalate. That's something. That's Julius Allen's Heather Warren. Nah, now you're right. You're you're a thousand percent right about that. You're a thousand percent right about that. That could it could have been something surrounding that. Joining us now is Heather yeah, Warren. Right she is the school. executive director of the Center for Criminal Justice Reform at the University of Baltimore. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you for having me. Certainly. We had the city state's attorney on, and I'm just reading through some of your remarks, and you think when it comes to this bill, you called it misguided and harmful, and I'm curious of why. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I want to start by saying 
could not agree more that addressing gun violence, including the growing number of illegal firearms in our communities, must be of utmost priority. We just do not believe that this bill, this strategy is a way to get effectively at that problem. And I'm going to start by saying that not only um, do we believe it will not be effective, but also that it comes with great risk of actually undermining mm -hmm. public safety, of making that violence worse. When you talk to Mr. Bates, you get the feeling that he feels like law as it stands right now does not have teeth, and he feels like those who are offenders know the way around it. So let's say you get three years and you know you're only going to give uh, eight months, uh, that it sort of works in their favor. Um, what do you think when he says that, that if, if they're not teeth there, we got to add a little bit more so they take the crime seriously? Uh, the evidence base just simply does not support that theory. There is a large and growing body of evidence that lengthening sentences is not an effective way to deter crime. And actually, another. <laughs> Go ahead, Fisher. Oh, my God. <laughs> what do you do with that? I this mean, like, right. <laughs> this, is, this woman is, 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 is pleading. Again, this is why when I say they demanded this, a years, a couple years from now, this woman, she's going to get like clocked upside the head or something, carjack or something. And we're going to be mm -hmm. like, she demanded this. And this is what I'll be talking about, guys, when I say they didn't ask. She's not asking for this. This is a demand for less sentences. She's pleading for lighter sentences for thugs in Baltimore County, like Fabian said, violent psychopaths that fight discharge guns wantonly and recklessly in public spaces over tweets. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, no, but see, the, the problem is you just don't understand the evidence base. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like... You know, I mean, it's it's easy enough for people like us to sit around like, you know, and 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 hypothesize about these things. But she's t she's referring to science. She's referring to studies. She's referring to, you know, uh, very, very prestigious um, information that's backed by studies and evidence. And so I think we just really need to kind of have a little bit of humility and sit back and, and kind of stay in our lane and leave these things up to the people who are, are doing these studies and collecting this evidence. You know what I'm saying? She's really, really smart and smart people are ruining America. Evidence that lengthening sentences is not an effective way to deter crime. And actually another groundbreaking report on this exact topic came out the day that we filed our written testimony. So, so again, I think that that um, the fervor and the, the literature behind that is only growing. Um, the, the other thing that has been clear about the supporters of this bill's talking points is a kind of a faulty set of assumptions about how deterrence works. You know, there's a big difference in the certainty of apprehension and some consequences versus the severity of that, of those consequences. And currently- Is she talking about something, something like you're talking about Fabian? Like, is she saying that sun, the sun mind, maybe she's talking about the sun mind. Look, if you, no matter what the sentence is, in that moment, if he wants it or he's feeling disrespected, he's going to act on that impulse. Is that is that what she's saying? In a bit? Is that might that be what she's saying? I don't know. I didn't quite catch it. I was distracted for a second. Okay, I'm gonna let you. Of this bill's talking points is a kind of a faulty set of assumptions about how deterrence works. You know, there's a big difference in the certainty of apprehension and some consequences versus the severity of that, of those consequences. And because she's talking about 100% almost sun teens that she's dealing with the population she's speaking about. Could she be talking about that? Like, like that, like, you look, these people are different. It could be because, well, she's, she's definitely doing a bit of, she's talking a bit about psychoanalysis. What she's saying is, uh, confirm that I'm, I'm getting it right. What she's saying is that in the minds of people that are committing these acts, the fact that they're definitely going to get apprehended uh, weighs differently on them 
than the consideration of the severity of the of what's going to happen to them when they're apprehended. Mm -hmm. That's what she's saying. So what's the where where is she going with that? I think she's saying, like I said earlier, once you got apprehended for this in the where these the, where these people's genes and their DNA evolved. That was it. That was it. Well, so she's saying, yeah. So she's saying that the the certainty that you're going to get apprehended is going to deter them much more than considerations yeah. of how long they're going to be. Oh, definitely. There's no, yeah, there's no pimp. There's no sentence. There was no jail. Was, yeah. That got, what what makes what makes criminals brazen is because they think they can get away with it, not because they think that they're going to do less time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. The lie that she's saying is it's actually both. I mean, let's be completely yeah, honest. If you knew yeah. you were going to get apprehended and do a day in jail, what's that? Exactly. You know, exactly. it's both. But what what that's what I mean. You have to watch with how these criminologists play with the numbers yeah. and their methodology and their studies. Because, like, for instance, they'll say, oh, there's a whole bunch of people in jail just for drugs. It's like or they had drugs. It's like, yeah, well, did he shoot up a store with marijuana in his pocket? Like <laughs> looking at all the charges and saying 70 percent of them are drug charges. But that's because they had some weed on them when they were doing something way more violent. And that's how they that's their methodology. They don't dig deep into the numbers. Yeah, no, you that's know? that's what I'm that's that's why I'm asking, like, what's her angle here? Because, like, yeah, you can you can make a statement like that, that on its face, it's like, OK, it's true. It makes sense. But usually these kinds of statements are deployed simply to erode the capacity of of law enforcement to work or, you know, various things like that. So I'm wondering what, what, exa what exactly she's pushing for with this, you know? Oh, Go ahead, Mayo. Hold on. Mayo, you got the floor. She's conflating. She's talking about deterrence. But in the guise of the crime's already been committed. It doesn't make sense. What do you mean? How can you deter a crime that's already been committed? I think she's I think what she's saying is that the certainty that you're going to get apprehended is more of a deterrent than a consideration of the severity of the punishment. Isn't that what she's saying? Yeah. That's like, that's like me saying like, if I go rob Mayo, I know I'm going to get my head blown off. But if I think I have like a 99% chance that he's not going to be in the house, I'm going to go rob his house. It's, she's no, it's, it's the like this. Of me it's committing the crime. Like if I had a hundred percent that I knew I was going to face some kind of penalty, but what she's not saying is that, is that the deterrent is also the severity. So, like, if I rob a dude's house and it's like all he's going to do is 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 throw, like, I don't know, like a dish at me or a, a fork or something, I'm going to do it. Like, if I know he's going to – it's both. No, it's but here, both the here's time. the thing. It's, it's like this. It's like if you, if you cheat on your girl, when you're out cheating on your girlfriend and you're out at a hotel or wherever you're cheating, getting caught. Say she say she finds a number in your pocket while she's doing your laundry. Getting caught, yay! Yeah, we're all every guy's scared. He that's why he's cheating. That's why he's tiptoeing around. That's why he's sticking around. But when you do get caught, if your girl's like mad for a day and she's giving you the silent treatment for a day, and then a day later it's okay, yo, you're gonna cheat on her again. More so than if your girl, right. if your girl oh, puts, hell yeah. puts, puts all your shit on the front lawn and sets it on fire, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When she takes it back, you're not gonna, you're gonna let, less likely to cheat on her. <laughs> I mean, basically, to me, it just it just sounds like regardless of the regardless of the merit of the argument that she's making, it just sounds like at the end of the day, she's just trying to get sentences reduced. Exactly, that's just it's pandering. The severity I mean. of that. Of those consequences. And currently, there's actually not certainty um, in consequences due to systemic deficiencies. But in order to achieve that, oh, there it is right there. Like, um, yeah. Probation Get and non custodial out. approaches are a far more effective um, response than giving people longer terms uh, of prison and jail. Give us the alternative well, you, as you look at this holistic approach, because you talk a lot about the uh, the trauma that may come from being away from your family from a long time or not being able to see uh, your loved ones and missing that connection and what it happens down the road. So if you were if you had the magic pen and you wrote the law yourself, tell me about how the consequences would work. 
Absolutely. Well, I want to focus on what I think is the most effective um, thing that we, we can and should be doing, which is bringing public health approaches to this problem. Um, you know, this is, again, this is really about what are the alternatives? How do we most effectively address the, the problem that we're actually trying to solve with gun violence and the reason people pick up the guns in the first place? So we, we lay out a long list of alternative let me help you out, lady. The reason people pick up the guns in the first place is because it's an easy way to kill the guy that you want to kill. Like, I want to I want to kill that guy. And of all the options, this one was the most efficient and most effective. At least the dude asked a real question. Like, she's yeah. given a bullshit answer, but I'll give yeah. her credit. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, well, he probably knew. He probably already knew exactly what the, the, the these questions and these answers have been given so much. It's like a script. I'm sure right. he, he knew exactly what oh, yeah. the what the scripted answer was going to be. And it's all, it's all, it's all nonsense. It's all gobbledygook. It's just squidding. We, we it heard does, the... it, it, it addresses everything except the reality of the situation. Yeah, we already. And, and we heard the watchwords, public health and systemic. gun in the systemic. same sentence. And and also the system, uh, systemic bullshit. Non-custodial yeah. measures. Yeah. I mean, Do you think she would admit that the average 13-year-old in the hood knows what a Glock switch is and maybe like 25% of them know how to operate a gun with a Glock switch? I mean, well, that's be because he. Yeah, that's, that's just because crazy. he has not had sufficient access to mental health interventions. Well, all right. Yeah, because yeah. therapy will fix the black community. Just ask him. Yeah. <laughs> he needs a massage. It, it's it's all that slave massages. era trauma. It's all that slave era <laughs> DNA induced trauma. Yeah. Exactly, I, and you, and you carry it in your muscles. And if you look at the race disparity in in access to massage therapy, you that you'll see it right there. Yep. Yeah, she doesn't understand that. Like, yeah, she, she doesn't will. understand the people. This is what I was talking about earlier. She doesn't understand the people she's talking about. She's the, the hood is a massage expert. collar desert. But she's the foremost expert on black people in this. They call the news station has her on. She's a professor at some university. Yeah. So she's and, and this university is in Baltimore, man. Yeah, she's an expert. And on Baltimore black is is their laboratory, <laughs> and nothing they've promoted in the last twenty years has done anything to help. Yeah. Change the battle plan, man. God. But she's not. I don't think she's really interested in any of that. I think she's probably just. I think they like kind it. of, kind of, kind of narcissistic. And her job, the yeah. way that she displays prestige, is to repeat the shit that has been told to her is the prestigious shit to say. That's yeah, what she's, she's doing. Just looking, she's probably doing this for a career. To tell you the honest to God truth. Oh, this yeah, is her job. How much, money, yeah, how much money does she get to go on TV and, and repeat this shit? Like, this is just like academic university bullshit 101. And she's just oh, yeah. like spewing it. Like, we've, we've heard this shit before and it has nothing to do with reality. But she's her job isn't doesn't have anything to do with addressing reality. She comes on the show. She probably, if she's a professor, she repeats the shit to her students. She comes on TV, repeats the shit on TV. She gets a paycheck. She goes home. She's comfortable. She watches TV. She drinks her wine. She pets her cats. You know, wa rinse, repeat. Oh, and the, the, uh, the, Bureau of Prison study completely debunks what she's saying about what criminals are afraid of and what they're not afraid of. Yeah, they're definitely afraid of time. Here's my thing, though. If I was to come on here and talk about meerkats or fucking gila monsters or any kind of fucking animal, fucking prairie dog, if I was an expert, if I was touting myself as an expert on that, and I had no clue about Perry. Like I didn't have the first. I didn't know why they barked. I didn't know why they fucking um, stayed in their holes. I didn't know how they dug their holes. I didn't know anything about that. But I, the news channel brought me on as an expert on Perry Dog. It would be fucking insane. The only time they get to be experts on some shit that they know absolutely nothing about the actual well, subject. Uh, how how did she become an expert? By reading a list of books her professors gave her. Yeah. Because yeah. Right. that's her qualification. 
C- criminology I mean, is like a derivative of sociology. It's a soft bullshit yeah. science. Yeah. And basically yeah. what it is is all the people like her. So what you're saying, Ak, is that I understand what you're saying, but everybody that's like her thinks this way. So it's like other professionals are just it's it's like a confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not getting it's a any hive mind. Back. Yeah, it's, it's a, a hive mind. mind. Like, it, it's right. a soft and when this and when her and people years like- ago to me in community college, I've got an associate in criminal justice. This was taught in the early nineties by leftists. I had never even known there was people like this in Ohio until my professors were all telling me, you know to get this new style of policing. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the cowboy sheriffs where I'm from will just whip your ass. Like I don't play with them, you know? Yeah. And when, when people going around repeating this shit for years and decades does nothing whatsoever to stop crime, then the, the, the next part of the script is just to say like, well, we haven't done enough about systemic racism. We haven't done enough about the root causes. We haven't. Another chapter. Just go to another We haven't fixed that massage desert yet. Yeah, yeah, let me yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Um, solutions in our written testimony, and I'll, I'll name just a, a couple of them. I mean, one, uh, uh, improving trust between police and community. You know, I know we have a very long way to go <laughs> at work. And oh when God. people who are carrying guns for protection or out of fear or in a very well-documented response to the trauma that they have already experienced related to gun violence, And they don't trust that when they pick up the phone to call law enforcement, um, that that entity will protect them or will not harm them. Um, There's there's a real problem there. So I think there's a. So it's the cops' fault that they kill (laughs) him. It's the cops' fault that a guy with a with a felony record, as long as a CVS receipt, has a gun and is afraid to call the cops. Yeah, but the, the bigger issue is she claims that it works, but then she says there's a long way to go. So where's your data that it works? If you've got no data saying that that even works, and I'm not even saying that it – I'm not saying it would. I'm just saying she they just draw bullshit conclusions from not well, – Even any study based in the last four years, if you ask a criminal about is, is getting time a deterrent, they're going to say no because they're not getting time. Exactly. <laughs> a lot of work that would be effective there. I also think how we treat victims and witnesses of violence. Now, this is something very much in the purview of the state's attorney's office. I actually um, led a, an assessment for the city of Baltimore on how victims of violent crime are treated, focused on black and brown victims of gun violence. And there are just many deficiencies there, many opportunities to change our approach and improve access to services in ways that are effective at uh, reducing the risk of that person's future victimization and reducing the risk that that person will later pick up a gun and harm someone else. So those are just two. There, there are many sure. other alternate strategies as well. My God. Yeah, the first one being moving the hell out of Baltimore. Amen. As wow. soon as someone even says black and brown anymore, I just know they're a bullshit <laughs> right. artist because right. that's a bullshit. Yeah. Like there's some black and brown oh, yeah. Yeah. Mexican it's like, and like black folks. Yeah, okay. Yeah, black and brown, Latinx, Latinx <laughs> right? Any of those words <laughs> tied in with the BIPOC, BIPOC, oh, systemic. They don't even know what systemic means anymore. Yeah. They just fucking say it. These white people <laughs> gonna take us to hell, y'all. And I am white. Yeah. It's horrible, man. Yeah, man. Oh, believe me, I want to choke the shit out of her too. I mean, just the way she pronounces her words, Mayo, like just gets inside of my skin. Like I know what Fisherman's talking about. It makes my neck like set on fire, man. On that note, on that note, man, guys, man, great show, man. I'll see you guys later, man. Peace out. All right, I'll have a good one.